Well, um, my name is Rahil Raza, and I think uh, I am a humanist Muslim. Uh, you know, people try to label us by calling us moderate or progressive, but these words are now done. I've looked at all the work that I do and human rights being one of the most important things to me. So I think I would call myself a humanist Muslim, a mother and a grandmother. Well, I was born in Pakistan and I'll age myself if I tell you that was a long time Please ago. Don't. <laughs> but um, it was a time when Pakistan was very different and the Islam that I learned in my home was very different. It was a very moderate version of Islam. Religion was not thrust down our throat. Uh, Pakistan was a liberal country where there were respect for people of all faiths. Uh, women were free to work, to be educated. In fact, uh, you know, I studied in a Catholic, Catholic convent. Both my schooling and college was done in a Catholic uh, institution. Uh, I also for a short while studied in co-education. And what I'm trying to say is that it was easy, it was relaxed, it was pluralistic, and there was, religion was a private choice, a personal choice. There were women in my family who wore a scarf over their head, my grandmother, for example, but nobody else. My mother, my sister, no one covered their hair. And it was, again, a personal choice. So it was a, a good time to be growing up in Pakistan, and it was a good education. I learned to speak English, thanks to Irish nuns who taught us. And, uh, but things changed. In the late 1970s, two things happened on the world stage. One was the oil embargo, and the other one was Khomeini's return to Iran. He had been in exile, and we know that instead of reading uh, French philosophers, he was reading the mandate of the Muslim Brotherhood, and that's what he took back with him to Iran. And very briefly, uh, he said that he was going to export the revolution, Khomeini did. And when Khomeini said that, Saudi Arabia, which is a majority Sunni country, had major conniptions because they thought that he was going to export the Shia version of Islam. So essentially, the major struggle in the world as it unfolded is a struggle between the Shias of Iran and the Sunnis of Saudi Arabia. And that is a struggle for hegemony, control over the entire Muslim world, and today, of course, non-Muslim world as well. The turf war between these two countries is played out in countries like Pakistan. So money coming in from both sides, and with that, an agenda. All of a sudden, women had to be covered in public. Um, the, the Christian uh, Catholic schools were nationalized. Everything changed. And that was about the time that uh, you know, I decided that it would be very difficult for me to live there anymore. I had already met uh, the love of my life, who also happened to be a Shia, although I'm from a Sunni family, so that was a clash. Uh, for our families. So all these reasons playing into it, it wasn't the same country that I had grown up in. Things were changing very fast and they weren't changing for the better. They were going backwards in time. And then we had an opportunity to leave. So both of us uh, left because both of us are activists and there was no place for a Muslim girl to be an activist. Although I grew up in a moderate family, it was still a culture of honor where women were supposed to be seen and not heard. So it's not as though I had full individual rights to do whatever I wanted. There were restrictions. Girls don't do this, girls don't do that. And of course, I wanted to do everything that the boys did. I wanted to play cricket. I wanted to uh, become a dentist. My father was a dentist. Um, I wanted to travel, ride a bicycle. And there was all these barriers. Boys had freedoms, girls didn't. My brother was sent abroad to study. Uh, for uh, the girls, it was just how soon can you get married? And that's not what I wanted to do. I think that the acti activism was something that was sort of instilled in, in my psyche. I also uh, rebelled against the, uh, the gender inequality and the social inequality. 
uh, you know, when I saw people who were being used as servants or kids that didn't get educated, I used to set up little schools for them and I used to teach them. So that sense of, uh, you know, social inequality was something that also pushed me along in my activism. Uh, so in the late 1970s, we left. We, we lived in Dubai for a few years and then came to Canada. And in Canada, I found freedom. I found freedom of thought, freedom of expression, uh, gender e equality, and it was like a breath of fresh air. And I was able to fully um, express my activism. But at the same time, what I was seeing, and something that was very concerning, was the fact that the ideology that we had left behind, the one that we had run away from, was slowly following us to the West. And although I did not set out in the beginning to be a full-time activist against radicalization, I wanted to be a best-selling author of a romantic novel. I mean, I'm, first and foremost, I'm a writer. That's my first love. But uh, I saw what was happening. Large immigrant communities had come to Canada from the Middle East, from the South Asian subcontinent. And with them, they were bringing what we call excess baggage. And this excess baggage was an ideology that was based in the seventh century Arabia. Uh, it was an ideology like that, the one being promoted on the backs of billions of petrodollars from Saudi Arabia, an ideology based on divisiveness, on hate of others, uh, not pluralistic at all, uh, very exclusive, exclusivist, exclusivist and supremist. And this is what was very concerning. I mean, essentially, um, you know, in, in my heart, I know that you have to be humble and you have to respect uh, everyone. We don't even use the word tolerate because tolerate is such a wishy-washy word. It's not about tolerance. It's about acceptance. It's about respect. It's about love for others. And this is how I had grown up. And this is what I knew. And I wasn't seeing it around me. And I wasn't seeing enough people, enough Muslims, especially Muslim women speaking out. So I fell into this by default, where I started writing for the local newspaper. Um, and I started speaking out because, you know, all this sort of snowballed into people reading my articles. I started writing about benign things because, you know, it was about uh, South Asian culture and uh, a little bit of information about Islam, which people didn't understand. And throughout this, I felt that my faith had been stolen. And I was damned if I were going to let these radicals run away with the faith that I had grown up and I had seen was very different from what they were presenting. So the extremists, the radicals, the Salafis, the Khomeinists, were Muslim Brotherhood, they were presenting a face of Islam that was ugly. And I was having none of it. And so I started the activism and I started speaking out against this and saying that this is wrong. And of course there was major pushback. And uh, about five years ago I set up an organization called the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow because it was, it was important to have a foundation from which I could work. I am president of the council. And uh, our vision is to have Muslims come into the 21st century, to have a pluralistic, tolerant vision of Islam, and most importantly, to have an alternate narrative to the narrative of the extremists. Because while in this journey, I was criticizing what the extremists were saying and doing, and, and I will use the term Islamist, because there is Islam, which is what I follow, and then there are Islamists who follow a political, a theopolitical ideology. It's a cult. It's like fascism. It's like communism. Uh, it's not at all spiritual. So the Islamists were growing by the day because they had found a safe haven in the West where the leaders were so wishy-washy and so politically correct that they were able to come and establish their organizations and their institutions and they were thriving in the West. So this was of great concern. And our organization, uh, specially named Muslims Facing Tomorrow, was so that we could move into the future so that we could live by the values that brought us to the West, 
you know, the values of, of a democracy, of freedom of speech, uh, freedom of choice. Uh, for me, as a Muslim woman, it became extremely important to speak about the issues facing Muslim women. And I used my own experience for that. Uh, you know, I used uh, the lives of women in Pakistan and in, in the rest of the Middle East. And um, here I am. I, I am very concerned about the, the lack of integration, um, about the lack of acceptance uh, by Muslim communities that, that have come recently. You know, again, all this has happened in the last 40 years. You know, this mass migration that has happened. And it's not always for positive reasons. When I came with my family, I came to make Canada my home. And I taught my sons, I have two sons who are grown up, I taught my sons a sense of loyalty to the land which is now their home. And that is so important and I don't see this happening even in schools in America and all across North America, this idea of loyalty to the land in which you live, which by the way, is an Islamic concept. You know, the Prophet said, you must owe loyalty to the land in which you live, unless you're forced to go against the faith. But of course, you know, the Islamists say, no, you don't owe loyalty to this land. Your loyalty should be to the mullah in Iran or the mullah in Pakistan or the mullah in Saudi. And this is why you see young people who are so immersed in this theology and this idea that their loyalty is to some religious uh, leader somewhere else, that they can, uh, excuse the language, blow up at any given time. You know, people ask this question, how is it that uh, Western-born young people can become radicalized? It's actually very easy. You know, I could have radicalized my sons. People have asked me, how is it that your sons are not terrorists or extremists? It's because we educated them. We educated them. We taught them the faith at home, not sent them anywhere else to learn. So to come back to the idea of integration, of settlement, it is very different. There are many, many immigrants who come with the idea of settling, and they have thousands, and you know, they are loyal citizens, they have integrated. But then there are thousands of others who come just with an idea that they're going to use all the benefits, but their loyalty is to another country, to another leader, and most importantly, to a, an ideology. And this is where separation of mosque and state is so important for us. One of the mandates that we work at in the reform movement is to have separation of mosque and state. Because unless that happens, we are not going to have this integration because there's all, there will always be a um, allegiance to some mosque, some imam, someone, someone else. But the allegiance should be to the country in which you live. And that's one of the, the parts of this journey that is very troubling, that is very challenging, that is very difficult, because the education that is coming to our youth is not necessarily pluralistic. You know, it's very, again, it's very supremist. You know, that you are special, you are the best, and everyone else doesn't matter. That's not the education I gave my boys. It was that you are a human being and everyone else, if you want respect, you have to give respect. And that is, where a lot of the, the issues come on the conversation around the dining table. But since that is not happening, our job is to create that alternate narrative. So those young Muslims who are caught between the mosque and the mall and have nowhere to go uh, to get answers to their questions, to ask these questions, is where does my loyalty lie? You know, my parents tell me that my loyalty should be to Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, whatever. Where we want to talk to them. We want to create circles of dialogue, uh, circles of communication, and explain to them there's nothing un-Islamic about giving loyalty to the land in which you live. And that alternate narrative is what we are here to present. Uh, and that alternate narrative is twofold. There's one for the Muslims, and there's one for the non-Muslims. Because even people who are not Muslim are picking up their information about Islam from mainstream media or from sources that are only speaking about one side of it. They don't get to hear the voices of reform-minded Muslims or moderate Muslims. And the question, every time there is a terrorist attack, the question comes up, where are the voices of the Muslims? So we said, you know what? We are here. Ask us whatever you want. 
We are loyal, caring citizens of the countries we live in. We are of different diverse ethnicities, but we care about our faith and we care about you. And that is where it begins. We know there is a problem. We know that radical jihadist ideology is one of the biggest global threats today. We don't shy away from that. And those of us who are working in this field are willing to say that this is an internal problem and we need to deal with it. But we can't dismiss the idea that Western leadership has really led to this. And in the last 10 years, the political correctness, the regressive left, all these movements that have come up, they have fed into this. They have fed into it to a point where I, as a Muslim, can't criticize a radical Islamist ideology without being called an Islamophobe. Where does that leave us? And, and this has moved so fast. It's well funded, it's well oiled, it's a machinery, and it puts us in a very, very difficult place. We are caught squeezed between the extreme right and the extreme left. Now, if you take the example of Europe, Europe has gone down a deep, dark hole. And a lot of it was the fault of the leadership in Europe because they did not address the issue when it was taking place. I've traveled on an educational trip to four large cities in Europe, and I saw the mess that they have created. There are areas that the police won't go. The government, instead of addressing the issues of rapes, of abuse, of uh, you know, the non-settlement of immigrant communities, they just look the other way. You know, it's, it's as though they're so fed up that they haven't been able to, to do anything. And it was a scholar who recently said that the only countries worth uh, saving that are left now is the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. UK has gone down a deep, dark hole. Europe has gone down a deep, dark hole. All we have to do is look at them and take an example. We don't want to go that way. But we are. The eight years of the Obama administration, and I say this with due respect, were a disaster for us. He could not even articulate the term radical Islamist ideology. So how was he going to deal with it? And in those eight years, I have personally seen the rise of anti-Semitism. I have seen the rise of the Islamist voices. because. And uh, the, the Islamists feed off of the anti-Semitism. There is rampant anti-Semitism in Muslim communities, in immigrant communities, textbooks, teachings, uh, sermons in the mosques, and they're allowed to happen. And except for us, there's nobody, nobody seems to be criticizing them. And if you bring this up, they say, no, 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 Islamophobia is rampant. That's not at all true. You know as well as I do that the statistics show that the hate crimes against the Jewish community are far more than they are against any other community. But that's not an issue that's being addressed, thanks to eight years of the Obama administration. So what do you do? He wanted to appease everyone. These are not people that we can appease. Let me tell you, they have declared a war against the West. And it's not me saying it. It's their words. When I first discovered this, and, and it's been a journey of revelation and a very painful journey. It's like seeing your child become a drug addict. This is my faith gone wrong. You know, it's the pain of seeing your faith being ridiculed, being mutated, being used to harm others, being used to promote hate, and that is what is happening. You know, in the last 10 years, the rise that I have seen in hate crimes and anti-Semitism and the violence is unprecedented. And I fear for the safety and for the well-being of future generations of my children and my grandchildren. You know, people ask me, why do you do what you do? Because what I do brings me no accolades or, or medals. What it brings me is death threats and, and uh, hate mail and a lot of pushback. But I do it because first, there are not enough people speaking out. Secondly, it's for the future generations. I don't want my children who happen to be Muslim to grow up in a, in a world where there is so much hate. And if there's anything that I as an individual can do, I'm a mother and a grandmother, to alleviate that hate, to build bridges and speak to people. This is why this event is so important. And we need to have Muslims speaking in every state, in every part of the Western world that is still, uh, so to speak, safe, so that there is hope, 
so that people can understand that we are the frontline warriors in this battle against the, the radical jihadists. But we can't do it alone. We need the support. Look at the other side. The, the, the other side, which includes the regressive left, which includes all these movements, which includes, yes, you know, black lives do matter, but what about Jewish lives and women's lives and Muslim lives? Every life matters. The Me Too movement, do they ever talk about honor killings? Do they ever talk about the fact that women in the streets of Iran are being arrested in jail just because they uncovered their hair? Do they ever speak about the issue of forced and underage marriage? Female genital mutilation, which is on the rise right here in the United States? No, because it's too much of a taboo subject. Why don't they speak about it? This is a conundrum that I have seen for quite some time, you have feminists. The whole feminist movement doesn't say very much about what's happening to women no. in Islamic countries. Why don't they do that? What is the rationale here? Well, I am so disappointed in the feminist movement, I really, because they don't speak about the lives of women in Muslim majority societies because they've been told not to. They've been told that it's taboo. They've been told that this is a, a, you know, a cultural issue and it's their problem. No, we are living, we are Western citizens. It is our problem. When something happens to a woman, it's a human rights problem. So therefore, it is my problem. They never talk about it. And so I, I've just drawn back. I mean, I've never been able to understand the conundrum, as you say, of why they do not address these issues. And I can't wait around for them to do it so we do it you know we go ahead and speak about these issues and we'll continue to do so I mean this is a never-ending journey this is a never-ending battle I think till my last breath I will be fighting for an alternate narrative I will be fighting against the jihadists I will be fighting against the Islamists and I will be fighting to make the world a better place I, you know, we can we can go on and on about this. We will save some for tomorrow. But okay. you you just explained it so clearly and so brilliantly, and and still so many people are blind to this because they don't let themselves think. They don't, and they're afraid to speak. So we have to shake that status quo. We have to, and coming from us, it is acceptable. Coming from us, it's kosher. So we can do this. You know, we as five Muslims can stand up and say, we have a problem and this is what we're going to deal with. Uh, you know, El Elham's expertise is this nonviolent extremism and, and she is brilliant. And I'm already talking to her about finding ways to keep this circle going. We have to. Uh, to save our country. We, it's, we, it's a big job. It's a big job, but you know what? These voices need to be heard, and we have to do it. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, you were talking about uh, you had a conference of researchers for medicine. This is what it is. It's like finding a cure for the virus by continuously communicating and researching and presenting the problem uh, isolating it and then finding the cure. But look at the majority of people. They haven't even acknowledged that the virus exists. So you're not going to find a cure for cancer if you think it doesn't exist. And this is a cancer of the soul.